without question one of the great researchers working on the planet now to try to roll back the mists of lies over the centuries and millennia that have been used to the advantage of the controllers to completely obfuscate our real history and heritage on this planet is Michael Tellinger. Michael graduated from uh, Wits University in 1983 with a uh, bachelor's in... Far- we'll find out more about that degree in a minute. He's an author, a scientist, an explorer, has become a real-life Indiana Jones. Uh, he's made groundbreaking discoveries and has been on this program several times. Very happy to have Michael back tonight. He's an amazing man. Are you there, Michael? I'm here. Can you hear me, Jeff? Fine, loud and clear. Excellent, excellent. Well, you're in uh, Southern California now. We're actually in Las Vegas at the moment. We're heading for Southern California tomorrow morning. All right. Remember, don't gamble. <laughs> well, we're gonna after our interview, we're gonna t- be taking on a little tour of the strip. To you know, while we're here, we might as well see the light. You will. You can't miss them. All right. Now, yeah. since you were last on the program, you, you have obviously continued the frenetic pace. You're one of the busiest people in the field of research and trying to find out what, what we've been lied to about for so long. Uh, tell us, uh, oh, first of all, I mentioned your, your B Farm, P-H-A-R-M degree. What, what was that about? It's pharmaceutics. It's Bachelor of Pharmaceutics. A drug pusher. I thought so. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I learned how to make drugs, and uh, the government didn't want to hire me, so you know, I had to find another job. Good. Well, thank goodness they didn't, and thank goodness you have. All right. Since we last talked, what have you come across? And I'll never forget the picture of you standing next to that, what, six-foot-tall foot impression? Uh, in the in the what's rock now? Obviously, it was molten at some point, and somebody stepped in yeah. it. Somebody with a very large foot. Yeah, that that I'm glad you brought that up because you know that that giant footprint in rough granite. That's what it is. It's a type of granite. The actual uh, geological name for that is cristiform granite. It's a huh. very well recognized geological formation in South Africa and Southern Africa. Mm-hmm. And and one of the you know most common uh, re- responses I get when I posted that little video clip I posted two or three now um, was you know you're an idiot you can't leave a footprint in granite it's an igneous rock and you know my answer to that is I know that the question is <laughs> how did it get there yes and <laughs> see it's all about asking the right questions uh, yeah and exactly that is the right that. question. How did that get exactly. in that rock? And that it is an extraordinary piece of uh, of history. It, it's obviously made by a giant, and I don't know who these people were. Uh, we don't know what was really from the bottom of the foot up, but it looks darn familiar. Yeah. I, I, what's fascinating about that, Jeff, is that it's, somehow it, it keeps coming back to gold and the mining of gold and human obsession with gold and even the giant's obsession with gold. Um, the the one of the ways that there are several ways that a footprint can be made in granite like that. Uh, one of the ways is um, was disclosed to me by a, a, a chap from Canada, who's a third generation uh, gold explorers in the eastern part of Canada. And after he saw this and he saw all the silly comments on on the you know, the, the YouTube clip, he sent me an email saying, "Listen, I know exactly how this happened. This is not unusual. We see this happen all the time." And uh, incidentally, granite is apparently a component of epoxy, uh, which I was told oh, really? by a scientist just the other day. Yeah, oh, that's very granite, interesting. Yeah, granite powder, and it actually has a has some sort of a, a, an ability to solidify and and create a, a become hard again. Well, the, this chap from Canada said to me that every winter, uh, and I forget his name, so I apologize right now for that. Uh, it just escapes me. He says that uh, during the summer when they mine the gold and they explore and they take the granite, they crush it because the gold is in granite in eastern Canada. Mm-hmm. When they crush the granite up and they create a, a powder out of it and they, ex- and they make a mush out of it and they extract the gold, whatever process they use, by the time they leave for winter, uh, they leave the granite lying around and it's like a, a sludge, like a, a, a mud kind of substance oh, lying around. Interesting. And then by the time they come back, uh, animals have walked through it, and you know, and they leave footprints behind in it, and they actually solidify, and the granite huh? becomes hard like concrete. There you go. Uh, There's your viable explanation as to how a large 
humanoid could have made a footprint like that in granite. Interesting. And and the interesting common denominator is that in South Africa, all my research revolves around the mining of gold in ancient times. And uh, the explanation about how this could happen in rough granite uh, is all about gold. Now, I find that a very interesting coincidence. Well, I think it's fascinating. Uh, we talked last night to Marshall Clarfeld. Cl- Clarfeld, uh, yeah. Yeah, and uh, about the issue of the Anunnaki and mining gold. Uh, in his view, and apparently Sitchin's view, the goal was needed uh, back on their home planet of Nibiru to scatter in uh, certainly micro, if not nano, size uh, in the atmosphere to prevent their ozone from taking off because their elliptical orbit took them so far from the sun they couldn't afford to lose any heat, that which they were able to generate either volcanically with magma and so forth or in other ways. But uh, that was the explanation at any rate. However... The interesting part about Marshall's statement, and apparently Sitchin's, was that the Anunnaki came here 400,000 years ago to begin mining gold. Now, that's a long time ago, because if if human interaction came much later than that, and they were doing the mining, and then created us to do the mining for them, uh, then where are we 10, 11,000 years ago, and why are the Anunnaki still here after 385,000 years? I, I, these are all questions. I don't have any answers, but again, I'm asking questions. Yeah, Th- those are very good questions and very relative and relevant questions. I'm not sure if anyone has any answers for them at this stage. We, uh, all of us, I guess, are speculating to some degree or or other. And um, oh, that's where what, we are. What it, what, yes. What What is important to know is that, um, or to to agree upon is that we need to be able to keep our minds open. And, and be prepared to change our perspective as we get new information. And uh, this is what I'm finding as I start mm-hmm. to delve deeper mm-hmm. and deeper into the vanished civilizations of South Africa and Southern Africa and, and presenting the physical evidence of the Anunnaki gold mining empire. Yes. There can be no more doubt about that, that it, is, it, was, it seems to be in South Africa that this vast gold mining empire was. Uh, not that they didn't mine gold in other parts of the world. Some people think that, you know, I claim it's only in South Africa. Not at all. But that's where we find the, what seems to be the largest concentration mm-hmm. of the Anunnaki mm-hmm. gold mining activity. Well, what, uh, what kinds of things now, If for those who have followed uh, Michael Tellinger, they'll know. But for our listeners who don't know Michael, what kinds of things have you found that speak clearly of massive gold mining operations over obviously an extended period of time? Well, there, there are various things. First of all, the, the more than 10 million stone, circular stone ruins that uh, lie scattered throughout Southern 10 Africa. 10 million now? You've calculated uh, there are 10 million? <laughs> yeah, more than 10 million. You know, this, this is, when, that, when that number hits you, you it, it's a shock to the system. And when I first, when I started counting them and, and trying to get an, at, at least some sort of an, an, a reasonably accurate estimate, when I was finishing my, my um, second last book, Temples of the African Gods, which has just been re-released a few months ago by Berenko, uh, re-edited and upgraded with some amazing information in it. It is now called The African Temples of the Anunnaki. And uh, I thought I couldn't mm-hmm. just thumb suck a number and, and put it in there because, you know, the speculation about how many stone ruins and circular stone ruins there are in Southern Africa have been going on for at least 200 years. And, and the speculations have, be, have, have been really interesting because they keep growing in numbers the more information we get. So just to give your listeners wow. a, a little, mm-hmm. a little a, you know, a quick rundown of the speculation of how many of these ruins there have been, and they've been a mis- these stone ruins have been known to Western civilization and Westerners since the late 1400s, since the Portuguese explorers first arrived in Southern Africa and came on shore from the Mozambican coast. Uh, when they came across the native populations there and they asked them who built these stone structures, they were very clearly told that they don't know. The native people of, of Southern Africa told them that they didn't know who built those structures. And, and that's equally and importantly fascinating, and we mm-hmm. need to remember that. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then from the mid-1800s, the real explora- exploration of the stone circles of Southern Africa started, most commonly with Great Zimbabwe. And Great Zimbabwe was the, the the place that, because it's so spectacular and so impressive, attracted a lot of attention. 
and and rightfully so because you'll see once you get into my work and my research, Great Zimbabwe seems to be the the the, the center point or the the headquarters of the Anunnaki gold mining operation. Okay, in South all right. Africa. Do we know this arrogant contemporary species of of human beings about our history on this planet? Really, five percent, ten percent? What do you think? Well, uh, it's a it's a, I'm glad you asked that question. There was a time that I used to start my presentations by showing a very simple calculation that everybody can do at home, that if we assume and what we are told that history is written by the victors, uh, and therefore our history books are constantly being swayed in favor to promote the agenda of those that have won the conflict, that means since the time that conflict on Earth began, and uh, that is obviously a speculative question. Uh, if you had to assume that conflict began some 6,000 years ago in the Sumerian time, and, and this model applies, that within 124 years of the first conflict starting, and there was only one conflict per annum, we would know less uh-huh. than is permissible by the laws of physics about <laughs> our human origins and our human history. Now, uh-huh. uh, that's a... That's an amazing statement. Less than, than permissible by the laws of physics, which is 10 to the minus of 33 Planck's constant, right? And, um, and that's just for people to put that thought in their mind. We know nothing about our human history and our origins. We are clutching at straws. We are scratching around and picking up tiny pieces of the puzzle right. and putting them into a, a giant puzzle. But what's important is that some of the pieces are starting to form crucial clusters of information that are starting to ring very loudly and resonate with what uh, many of us are starting to recognize. And and we also know that at the lead of the effort to obscure and hide our history, we have a birthright to this history, at the lead of the effort to hide all of this information has been, unfortunately, the Smithsonian. Uh, No organization has done more to keep from us that which we have a right to know. That's uh, that, that Indiana Jones warehouse of crates full of forbidden archaeology is true. Uh, there is a yeah, place like absolutely. that, probably several of them. Absolutely, yeah. I, yeah. You started talking about the giants at the beginning of this chat, and uh, I start my, pre- my current presentation with just talking through the history of humanity and the fascination of giants and the evidence of giants living on earth from you know the biblical scriptures to other ancient scriptures to the discoveries over thousands of years and and records that we have of giants that have lived on earth but yet when you go down to the pub and you're having a beer with somebody and you start talking about giants on earth people look at you very strangely and think you're cuckoo and (laughs) yeah these are all things that uh, just perceptions that unfortunately uh just like the information is being kept from us the education system is structured to keep us dumbed down and follow rules and orders and and just become oh, clones. I, in, yeah, getting yeah. getting dumber all the time too. Yeah, exactly. unfortunately. So, well, yeah, you know, I must throw this in here while we are on the subject now, Jeff, because my new book, which is I was hoping it'll be out by the time we came to America, but we didn't manage to get it out in time. But it should be out in the next few weeks. Uh, which is called Ubuntu Contributionism, a blueprint for human prosperity. It uh, deals with a lot of the stuff, but it also presents an, a beautiful alternative as to what we should be doing as a human race to get ourselves out of this disgusting and terrible situation that we find ourselves in, and that there, in fact, is a bright light at the end of the tunnel in, to, to this human misery that most of us find ourselves in. Oh, very well said. Yeah, I mean, we live in a time that is is crazy. 